Hello and welcome to Dancer's Support Mission by Sabine Chalon for Shine Your Light. Today we are uh, going to start a series of episodes of Dancer to Dancer Words of Wisdom. And the goal of those interviews is to meet the person behind a dancer and to share with you all the challenges behind the scenes and the highlights of someone's career. Today, I have the great, great pleasure to welcome Luc Louis de Lerès. Luc is a very dear friend of mine. We've known each other for a very long time. Welcome, Luc, and thank you so much for being here with me and with us today. My pleasure. So, Luc, you, I mean, you know, you have such a, a vast career, you know, you've done, you've been a teacher, you're still a teacher, you, 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 you've been a choreographer, you're still a choreographer, you've been a dancer. Are you still a dancer? Not sure. Uh, <coughs> I mean, you've organized so many things like summer courses, events, uh, you've written books. Uh, I mean, you know, so it, it, there is so much, we probably won't be able to cover everything you've done, you know, in your lifetime in this hour of interview. But I would like you to start by you telling us a little bit about how you started ballet and um, where you danced. I mean, what was a bit your, your career as a dancer? All right. Well, um, as you said, usually the stories become very long. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do my best to, to make a petit résumé here. And, um, but basically, I started in Brussels at the Royal Conservatory, and in those days, Bejar was still directing it, which meant I very quickly danced with the company as an apprentice, and we toured and we did a lot of wonderful shows, and um, I had a few mentors to guide me, and uh, from one thing came the other. Basically, I met Rudolf Nureyev in my hometown as he was dancing the wonderful um, uh, Chant du Compagnon Errant that Béjar made for him in Bortoluzzi. And um, uh, that encounter basically uh, launched my belief that I could still become a dancer because I was 18, looking 16, speaking 14, sleeping 12, you know, and <laughs> so basically um, I had no clue what was going on in the world. So um, I was lucky. I, I, I danced so quickly, which to a certain extent, um, was great for the experience and for what the future would have in storage for me as you know becoming a teacher and a choreographer so um but i went quickly to paris to uh, do extra classes with teachers i researched i had been recommended like daniel franck who was a paris opera teacher and um uh, Monsieur Franchetti, Raymond Franchetti, who was then a director of the company, had his own school. And I would do courses as many as I could. So things went very quickly. Um, I, I got a scholarship thanks, uh, scholarship thanks to Rudolf at the uh, school in Monte Carlo. Um, the place was Casa Mia with Marika Bezobrazova, who was a very famous teacher. And um, so I got a scholarship there. I remember her saying, you know, he looks so crooked, but you know, he wants it so badly, he'll eventually dance. And, <laughs> and <laughs> so she meant crooked because I came from a rower's background as opposed to, you know, uh, dance. And um, yeah, I was on stage two minutes later again, you know, there were always performances with the school, with the Ballet de Monte Carlo, with wonderful, inspiring dancers like Rudolf Norea himself. And, uh, Carla Fracci and Evdo Kimova, all these people were always on stage while we were doing, you know, hopping around them. And, um, and then one day, Floris Alexander, who was a, sort of, he and his wife had mentored me from the beginning. Um, I got to go to Italy and dance with the Carla Fracci company for a season. And that again, gave me a taste of something I really wanted, which was classical ballet. Um, it did not, um, but it did provoke Bejar being slightly disappointed and mad at me because I did not return, you know, and, and only did later on, I went back to dance with the company. And then from one thing came to another, I, I went back to Paris to study again um, uh, with uh, Daniel Franck. Um, I had three auditions, which fortunately from my then very fragile ego, I was able to, to, um, to be convincing enough to get contracts for Roland Petit in Marseille, uh, for London Festival Ballet, 
um, and uh, and then there was the audition for the Paris Opera Ballet. So uh, I didn't want to do that because my goal was to study more uh, since I started so late and I wanted to go to Cuba. I had that opportunity, I had audition, and then um, I would say destiny changed it. And Monsieur Franck prepared me for the audition Paris Opera. And um, well, I, my best friend and myself, we came out first. So I always said that the level was so low <laughs> that we came out first. But then, you know, we had wonderful experiences um, with the operas and with doing like the Petrushka filming with Nureyev. And, um, but I did not like the ambiance. I felt very restricted. Um, I, I did start choreographing early. Um, so it, it was a very uh, interesting period. It was very creative. But um, I just never felt good because there was a tradition in, in the house. Um, not that I'm not comfortable with traditions because they have the wonderful music and the opera and, and the ballet. Um, I didn't like the politics. So um, I was not about to, to indulge in any unspoken blackmail between some of the heads of the opera house and, and myself. And I saw them around, I saw what happened. So I basically, I looked for other places and um, Again, I think Destiny uh, brought Janine Chara on my path. Um, uh, she auditioned me. I got a principal contract for the Hanover State Opera Ballet. Uh, I did some of the classics there. I got a soloist contract for Berlin Ballet, which then I did not honor because my favorite teacher was Alan Howard, moved thanks to Rosella Hightower to Nancy de Grand Théâtre. So I went there as a principal. I choreographed my first big ballet there. Um, and then I... I went to America and um, I decided, you know, that's been enough dancing. Um, not that I didn't enjoy dancing. I just, um, I felt probably more at ease in teaching, coaching, guiding, choreographing was seemingly so, but a second you, skill. You, you started mm. quite late, right, dance? So yes. what made you decide that this is what, I mean, apart from the, the performance with Norea, for, you know, what really made you think, oh, I'm going to be a dancer, you know? Well, I, I didn't think I was going to be a dancer. I just, uh, it kept, you know, for all the performances I had seen, and I'll admit, um, I was not an aficionado of, of classical ballet at all in the beginning because at Béjac, you know, the men were dancing so much, which was, you know, very impressive and, um, and very inspiring. And so uh, I think the fact that uh, I couldn't, keep my hands off music and moving around at, at home. After I'd seen a show, it became clearer you more and more. You would go and see a lot of shows, even though you were not. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, in Belgium, because Bejar had shows almost every month, you know. So, you know, half an hour from Ghent to the train, and, and I had neighbors who, who took me along, and, and, you know, my parents weren't then not worried that I would never return home. But, um, I, but then the thing became, a, a, you know, a, a, more than a passion, it became an obsession. And so secretly I, I, I knew I wanted to do this, but I didn't believe it. Meeting Rudolf uh, and Floris Alexander, because he and his girlfriend, Madeleine Stelli, they were very instrumental in, in uh, you know, I, I had dinner with them the first, the first time I met him. He, Rudolf was very patient after a show. He was hungry, he needed a restaurant. And I thought, well, don't eat after 11 p.m. <laughs> so he said, where, where, where do you eat in your city? And I went, oh, God. So we, I remember one place opened, and I got them there, and, and I, I stayed with them for dinner. And then the next day, they introduced me to Bejar, and it was like, I didn't do anything. It was, they decided, you know, I was going to be doing this. And many, many, many years later, when um, I, a second passion came in, which was astrology, and I would study astrology and I would meet wonderful astrologers and they would just say, you know, May 18th, uh, 1971, the gods visited you because you were stuck. And that was it. It's exactly right, you know. So, but Bejar was a major inspiration. I definitely, I think, it, I think of it now, what an honor in a way it was to have such inspiring people around myself knowing nothing. I mean, I knew I loved opera. It was my first love. So I had seen a lot of operas. I loved classical music. Um, I, you know, I, wrote, I, I, I was sportive, you know, for, for four or five years. 
as a role where I prior just to my audition for the Conservatoire in Brussels, I, I won Belgian champion, double skull junior. So it was like, they were like, what are you going to do? Wear ponchos? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think everything was kind of like a passion, unthought out, um, completely in, uh, you know, unaware of what that meant. And it meant something to my parents because I'm from an old family, they're painters. My father was an architect and uh, they weren't against it. They were just completely like, couldn't you have told us early? You know? well, and, was it and, also uh, difficult for you because as a man, it was, you know, it, it was maybe a weird profession. I mean, it still is sometimes, unfortunately, you know. But it's a lot easier for the kids today. But um, I think, again, I was, the, the unawareness of my general being compared to, you know, through movement and dance and life, you become aware if you choose to. I was not. I just did. I couldn't have cared less if anybody liked it or not. Most people in my family, my teachers at high, in high school, they, they, they didn't like it. They were judgmental. A few were not. It, actually, my language teachers were kind of very positive about it. Um, yeah, I could see that many of my younger uh, co-students, um, they weren't always comfortable. There was also you know, the, the, the gay ghost hanging around, you know, because it kind of meant he's probably gay if he's going to do ballet, you know, it's like being a hairdresser, you know, so it, it was in those days, it's like, you know, they, they told me, be careful, men who are hairdressers and who have little dogs. I went like, so, <laughs> you know, but this, there, was this, there was this stigma hanging, you know, absolutely. But no, um, my parents were fine with it. Um, they were worried, of course, you know, this all of a sudden, I'm not going to study languages at university. And then, you know, a few months later, I'm on stage at, 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 in Brussels at the Royal Opera House. And, you know, and it went so quick. Everything went so quick. Uh, yeah. So what, what is this, the thing that you enjoyed the most as a dancer? I think the process, the working with the choreographer, the discovering how you are being developed into something that they want you to be. Um, that is, of course, much more as if you work solo. And I, I did so quickly solo work, so I was fortunate. But I liked the the, the, the Côte de Ballet, you know, you know the, the short time I, I got to be just one of the kids and in, in learning in the back and then stepping in last moment, oh my God, the excitement. When we had Romeo and Juliet <clears throat> at, the, at the Cirque Royale, and they told me last moment I had to get in. I went, oh my God, you know, it's like, it's wonderful because you get so exalted, you know, and then Bojar comes to tell you afterwards you did good, you know, I did one grand jeté, you know, so <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, the whole, the whole excitement, the touring, the, uh, the, you know, the friendships, the, the discovery of everything you don't know, you can actually do, you know, and, um, and it, it was like having a huge menu and you want to eat everything because you can't eat it all at the same time because you know what that. But um, it, it was, um, yeah, the camaraderie, um, the, the travels. I mean, we went everywhere, you know, just like well, you, you did. still traveled know. afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, well, that, so that's that, that's also to to come to you know you you had quite a smooth transition, right? Because you you went into choreographing and organizing a hundred things. I mean, you did kind of everything together. So what what would you say about your transition after dancing? You know, stopping dancing. How was it for you in the end? Um, well, it was dramatic for twenty four hours. You know, because I um, I had a kind of a lot of small injuries from the beginning because they pushed me so much and and in though i had been rowing so that was a force in the leg a uh, turnout was kind of absent <laughs> so there was always this extra work just to get that you know line and and eventually the line came but it, it to you know to, to a certain price and um i remember the year in hanover i danced with a cortisone shot in my hip every month because i couldn't be a prince with a turn in line obviously you know so and then when I, later on, when I decided I was going to uh, make, make, make the change, um, it, it, was, it was a very dramatic moment because I was learning my first balancing ballets, which were Four Temperaments and, and uh, Somnambula in Nancy because the Ballet Théâtre Français 
and then Kailin started the, the new company and I was in the in the Grand Théâtre. So she invited me and um, and then I had an offer to do my first Giselle on tour in Germany. So I went to work with Alan Howard, then I injured my foot. Um, it was like, okay, this is, has to stop now because I wasn't about to suffer for my art. You know, I mean, okay, we all have pains and we work at it, but I was just going to destroy my body in order to be on stage and recognized because there is in the inevitable thing about being the artist in whatever we do is there is that fine line you do it because you love the music, that you love the choreography, or you love the self on stage, which all of the above is fine, of course. Um, I wasn't so terribly interested about the last one. So well, I thought, you know. Loved on stage, you know, like, because the recognition gives you. Of, of course, when you're very, when, when you're young, when you're young, you, you'd like, you know, but I was so not, I, I liked, I liked the role. I liked interpretation, like actors who can be, you know, uh, uh, Romeo one day and then, you know, uh, Petruccio the next day or something. I thought that was fun, but I didn't really feel after a while, certainly not, um, do I need recognition of anybody because my parents gave me this from my, my very early days, you know, whenever I did something good, they, they'd say, oh, that was good or that was not so good, you know. So um, I didn't feel that. What I liked is, was the process. So when then I, I decided to stop, Violet Verdi um, directed the Paris Opera Ballet and she said, why don't you get a group together with some of your friends and, and just, you know, choreograph because I think you're talented. And I had, after my first three months in Brussels, um, we had a little workshop. Uh, students were asked to choreograph a few minutes, you know. So I immediately, oh, yeah, I'll do it, you know. So, and I knew nothing. So I was always about, you know, I need to create something. I was fascinating with teaching because um, my teacher at the Paris Opera, um, Monsieur Franck, he had his own academy. Uh, at one point, he asked me to teach a little once for a couple of weeks, and then he said, oh, you're going to be a teacher. So it, it was all kind of like in the works, and I had, to, I had to be a dancer. So for 10 years, I was on stage enough to find out what it was I would be able to, to coach or not. And I, I do have a belief that as a soul, we kind of have a, a program, you know. So there's bits and pieces from all the other lives, if you choose to believe so, which I do. So, you know, or, or the parallel lives, whatever it, you know, you'd, you'd like it to be. And so it seemed so obvious to me, coaching was so easy. Like I had danced all the roles, but I hadn't. It was clear. I Many I studied, of course, and saw my dance, but uh, everything came natural and um, I wanted to teach. And so I did. Okay. So then, I mean, you touched a little bit on that, but then obviously one of your challenges was to be injured, right? Because of the turnout, but what, what, would, what was your biggest challenge as a dancer actually, you would say? If I think of it today, I would say that, that the major challenge was the unconscious way of acting. <laughs> uh, you know, basically that is always coming back to my mind. Um, I spoke too much, you know, I'm, I'm a Gemini uh, and Gemini and, and, and uh, Aquarius, they're, they're, you know, they can't stop talking. So I, I could not stop talking about all the stuff I didn't like either, which was not the best thing in your career to keep expressing yourself about the way you see the things there are, especially the truth. But um, I think um, uh, basically, I think the excitement of the moment um, channels what it is you want to do. And my idea of consciousness was basically that in whatever profession you would choose, and of course in the, that time obviously with dance, that you would know why the things work and why they didn't. So because of certain pains I had, I looked at yoga, I, I looked at gyrotonic eventually, um, I looked at breathing, uh, at qigong and, and, and tai chi, and that brought an other balance, though again, I wasn't aware you need to have a balance, you know? <laughs> so I did So finally, you say it was a challenge if you were not, you know, you were not aware of it. I mean, no. retroactively, you see it as, as a challenge, but then... Yeah, it wasn't. No, okay. it's it's a it's a wonderful thing about being unconscious. It's I know. Nothing it's is wonderful. a challenge. You go like, 
Yes, but then I'm asking you, what was your biggest conscious challenge? You know, what you struggled with the most as a dancer? I think I struggled with the lies more than anything else because um, inevitably artists need to be encouraged, which is, which is fine. Um, but some of us also are being told they're going to be wonderful at something that we're not ready to do, for example. So um, well, you need more time or, you know, if you're going to have dinner with me, I make sure that you're on the, on the casting list, you know, and then from the dinner comes That's something else. <laughs> no, 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 no. These are tricks. So all of the politics, I think um, I, I was basically shocked that they actually existed because I had no idea that was a political world, you mm -hmm. know, and it's, it's never different in, in any of any of the political ways one goes about, whether it's in a university, whether it's um, in, in, a, in a dance company, uh, wherever, in the government or in everybody. But, so how um, was your way of dealing with that? I spoke too much. So, so you that wasn't bridges? Oh, I had candles in my, in my bag, I think. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, it did bring us, you know, I, I met ex extraordinary people. So, and, and I had great respect for the, you know, the many singers uh, like Montserrat Caballé. I befriended, you know, some of those wonderful people at, at one point. Um, my best friend, she was dating a famous tenor. Uh, I won't say the name because he's kind of out now because basically he dated so many other women. But um, but he was amazing. And we would sit in the canteen and, you know, Kiri Tikanawa would walk in and they loved the dancers. The, the, the singers always loved the dancers. So we had this wonderful time, great conductors, um, uh, Maria Callas, the people that I was fortunate to be on stage with or in a TV program or um, they they just they made life incredibly um, in that menu it's that menu again you know it's like there's so many good things on that menu why wouldn't we at least see or try everything so I think that for myself the the ballet or uh, was almost the excuse to be in so many different worlds that inspired me you know, and, and then later, because I was, because of who I'm, who I was to be, and, and I would always say I'm very much like my dad. My father was very caring for children and wanted to always the best and protective. And um, I would look for ways to teach that would make the students better in their understanding of how they could do it on their own without being, you know, me a guru of some kind of, you know, please come back and pay me again, that kind of thing. I thought, oh, great, now you've got it. Leave me. Allowing them to know themselves, you know, with your help. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, in those days, we, we weren't taught, you know, if there would be something, I would say, what did I not have when I was studying? Nobody taught me about meditation. Nobody said, why don't you stay quiet for a moment before you do your class, you know, because when I started dance, I, I would finish a little earlier high school, run to the train, fortunately five minutes away from the train station, got to Brussels, uh, did my classes, got back into the train, put everything, closed the doors, did everything over, went home, did the class all over again at home. So um, I would advance quick. I wanted to know why, you know, a turn would work or a balance would stay or you know, the landing of a jump. So I would do it again and again and again. And uh, that self-study obviously made me move very quickly, made people think that I was ready for roles that I wasn't, you know. And then, of course, you're not going to show it because you'd rather get injured, I suppose, than not <laughs> getting on stage to do it, you know. But um, the whole process in, in, in itself, of course, you know, you could just call it life. And, and, and that, that was fascinating. And I'm very grateful for, for all of this, you know, so. But, you know, you, I mean, of course, you went into teaching that was kind of organic. You went into choreography that was also organic and following the, um, the path of the dancer. But you also created a, um, an injury prevention uh, program that's called MOVE 
I always say it wrong, you know, and I even wrote it wrong this time. So I'm going to write, I'm going to read it. Move body aware, connect, right? And, and, and I know that, I mean, you've, you've, you've talked a little bit about what led you to that because obviously you've been injured yourself. You, so you, and, and from being unaware as a dancer, you realize that you could, you could actually have avoided maybe a lot of things had you been more aware at that time. And you definitely wanted to share that, but I know that you have um, quite a lot of projects with that program. So I would like you to talk a little bit about how you came about with this, how you decided to put it together, what it, in, it involves, includes, and what you want to do with it. Wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes. 15 another, questions in one. <laughs> not a big menu. Uh, well, um, I think, excuse me, the, so move body, work, connect, NBAC. First word, move. Um, we're always in motion. Life is motion. We can't go without it. Um, obviously, in dance, we're moving. Um, do we know the body very well in the beginning uh, in my career? Definitely not. You know, uh, you'd ask me what a metatarsis is. I would probably have thought it was a pharmaceutical product or something. So, um, uh, aware, as I told you before, completely, you know, unaware, uh, and connect that's connecting the dots of what it is you need. Um, I think because of, again, uh, to my fortune, having worked with, with quite a bit of wonderful people, but not just in dance, um, also the, the many researchers through alternative healing methods, um, uh, Partly, of course, movement, again, Qigong, uh, Tai Chi, yoga, gyrotonic um, were a big part of that. Um, but also, I was a Buddhist for a very long time because I wanted to know why in the world was I here and what was I to do. So what did it mean? Um, it, I was searching for the authentic self. Who am I really? You know, and that brought me to, at the same time as teaching classes, and, and working both with professionals and students um, and seeing their problems and wanting to help them. Um, I think that there are so many layers of our past where when the student or the professional in that case is ready to understand, you can pass on that particular knowledge. Not always one is ready. So I thought, I guess we need some kind of a program to go with it. Like, um, and I love gyrotonic. So people who go and study gyrotonic, they really access all the parts of the body, the vertebrae, how and why, and, and the loosening up of uh, letting go of the programs that are hidden in our body, basically, too. Yeah. So um, I took a long time, though, trying all of this out to figure out something that was basically very simple and, and, and brought in the breath. And uh, breathing is, of course, in yoga important in everything, uh, in, in the Oriental, more Oriental philosophies uh, and, and meditations, uh, breathing is, is prevalent. And so, it's um, it, I mean, you know. And absolutely. And, and dances, for, I often don't breathe. And I remember a wonderful teacher, great dancer, Madame Chauvire, Yvette Chauvire, uh, rehearsing Dominique Alfuni, first act Giselle, and she would go glissade and, you know, <sighs> you know the PTI best call, breathe out the next step. So I, I, that rang a bell, you know, like when the first time Alan Howard went French coup de pied, you know, enveloppé, which is also Russian coup de pied, and, and I thought, oh, wow, that shapes the foot but also it does this. So that's a movement. You know? So I, I little by little, I would find ways to bring, to accentuate the footwork because the more the feet can work, the more you understand how the metatarsis is in, uh, 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 need to be protected because you know, we have five toes, a little one is called little because it's so little. You know? So it's hardly of no use. So most dancers dance with three toes. You know, you're lucky if you have four toes and on point, it's even more, more uh, difficult for women. So uh, one of the things I did was I studied with, with Yamuna. This is her foot saver. Yeah. And, um, and so um, 
I, I took classes with her and then I had my own idea how to use them and um, she liked it. So she said, you can do whatever you want with it, you know, because it will help the dancers. So it actually, by using it on the feet, it, it opens the metatarsis, um, it, it um, uh, uh, strengthens and, and uh, uh, makes more supple where it's needed, but also the, the ligaments. Have, have, it's so well addressing the foot. And of course, once the foot is really in place, like you can use your feet like hands, then the rest of the body will, you know, uh, uh, be more protected because the position of the foot in dance, as we know, landing, taking off, uh, you know, very often the knee goes over the big toe and then there goes the meniscus. So all of that I knew nothing of, which is what I would have hoped teachers would have told me, you know, they didn't. In the Vaganova method, which you know very well since you were in St. Petersburg, um, they do have a way of teaching where they accentuate due also to the long process of seven, eight, nine years in school. So you actually have more knowledge of the body through the exercises. Yeah. Now but we it's are built very slow and the coordination is really built up very slowly, which makes it, I mean, of course, then it becomes second nature. Absolutely. And so now today, as in the last few decade, decades already, things have to go so quick. So then we do, and then we have to repair, as opposed to prepare before you know they need a reparation, you know. So, so the, I, the idea of MBAC was that I would create um, a, almost a platform where whatever it is you need that I'm going to offer in a workshop or soon to be uh, on a platform online where you can use all the tricks I was taught, I'll put it this way, you know. And that includes the, the way one, can feed oneself, you know, the way you can, you, the way you eat uh, uh, is extremely important, as we know. And um, uh, I would say that today, the young people, they are more interested in knowing um, how the body functions, you know. So you, you bring in information. I'm, the example, uh, uh, I was teaching for the San Francisco Ballet School, the school of the company, and um, uh, I would say that 80% wanted to know yeah you know, and that that's not like what in my days in my days we were told you know lift your leg jump and look pretty you know so and that we did <laughs> so yeah, there was no reason a coke in between to get some some energy <laughs> coca-cola and a <laughs> cigarette <laughs> yeah right yes. but also mbc if i allow <clears throat> Uh, love to, to tell you that the, the, the way it evolved was it was through the performances because in the festival so I did several festivals and one uh, was called um, one three weeks was called he healing the dancer and healing the dancer was something we did Santa Fe New Mexico um, then there was life in Vienna in Vienna Austria and the, the organizer had me bring a lot of healers from the alternative worlds put it this way who were fascinated by so the performances were the gift to the public and the public would discover all of the other ways um even when i did the, the um uh packed festival uh, we had like 55 workshops and performances in all the theaters in brussels for like two weeks uh in 98 and um uh, every morning there were workshops it, for the for the those who had an ambition to play the piano, uh, to 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 play the violin, or to uh, uh, become dancers, modern, contemporary, classical, and there was yoga. Hilary Cartwright was teaching yoga classes. Um, uh, we had wonderful people, you know, of all, all different uh, walks of life, to guide those who were interested to know what it takes to be on stage and and if something goes wrong. What would you do? So MBAC was lingering then, you know, this is, it is a time that everything developed as, as we all develop, you know, as teenagers until finally we go and then we dance a principal role and then you're ready, hopefully, you know, so. Um, it was the baby stage. Of voila, yes. Yes, yes. Wonderful. I mean, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this because I'm sure, I mean, I know you're building up, you know, something with that. So I think, and you also have projects with not only dancers, but for uh, other people, for children, for, you know, 
Yes. So I think it's a, such a beautiful project and, and initiative, really. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me because um, the, the MBAC has a little um, wing for those we call the elder, you know, like me. So, um, <laughs> but because not everybody has a physical ability to do everything. So certain exercises you can do some sitting down in the chair. You know, if somebody is 80 with a, with a physical problem, um, you can help them too, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a vast, it, it's a vast project. Um, it, it will hopefully be online by the end of this year and everything seems to be having, you know, going through a major delay because of this pandemic we've been going through for two years. You know, yeah. So. so let's talk about this pandemic. So how was it for you? Like, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, and practically, you know, what, what did it bring you and what, what did it take away from you? Uh, well, but I would say that it's, um, it was inevitably, as for most of us, a period of reflection, of uh, digging deeper into what changes would one want to make about one's own life once that the regular life will start again. And as everything is in movement, <laughs> um, life will continue moving. It may move in different ways. So I think we have to be ready to be adapted um, to many other uh, possibly unfortunate events. Uh, and we, we have to um, think ahead. So, you know, basically for myself, it meant uh, the time to work on my uh, personal relationship with my husband to, to work on uh, not that I had particular health issues, but I certainly can always do, you know, eat less sugar and, and, uh, and I'm not smoking anymore, but that's from way before. So, I mean, there's always corrections you want to do for yourself. Um, there's more time to read inevitably, uh, too. Um, I also took the time because, um, I had, um, I'd written a, a book that I kind of didn't believe I should get it out. And I did. And I was fortunate, uh, through, um, Sean Stone, who, uh, recommended my work to, um, the uh, uh, water site uh, publications in, in uh, San Diego. Uh, so I, uh, this was the result. And, and yeah. that, um, that's, uh, so that's, I mean, it's a wonderful book because there's so much information in it. Um, there's so many hints. I mean, if you're curious and if you read it, you have to read in between the lines as well and, you know, get curious and, look into all those words that you don't quite get because there's a lot of information in there <laughs> you put a lot of uh um uh yeah i mean zest of this that i mean you put everything together you we weaved it into the book uh but it's definitely uh worth investigating if you're not uh, familiar with all the terms that you're using right but it's a great uh fiction it's uh it's fun. It's a, it's a travel in time, right? So, I mean, you can talk about it. Yeah, it's a, I call it a, a time, a time travel thriller because I, I put a little bit um, of, of, uh, uh, a conspiracy story, a spy story, um, um, uh, mixed with the, you know, the Renaissance and, um, Parts of the story are uh, the ones that go back to the 1473 timeline are actually researched. So um, whenever I describe something from that period, it, it, it's, it's the truth as we know it from history books. Mm -hmm. So the, the Medici brothers and the Vinci and all of that is right, at, right out there. It's, it's not made up story. What I added to it were the visitors. So the visitors then become the communicators from the past, from the future, to tell them this is where we're going to go, you know. And then when you go back and it, you know, it goes from Paris to Geneva to to Florence, you find that there's always some some crooked actor who wants to come in and make people believe that they're destroying the world, mm -hmm. or maybe they do. So it's it is it has a bit of a thriller kind of thing in it, and it's as most authors, um, you know, you're in it. So my belief system is all over the book, obviously, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I like philosophy and, um, so yeah.
And, and so if, if you compare writing to dancing, I mean, how do you how do you put those two together for you as I'm, as a I'm, creative uh, you know um, medium? Well, um, there actually there's a funny you mentioned this because there is a chapter that's literally at the Royal Ballet in London. I think Hillary will have fun with that one because it it's it's actually it's the the Margot Fontaine days uh, in an early uh, Royal Ballet. Um, but um, yeah, again, movement. Uh, it, my first book, Spiraling Reality, is is um, is all poetry, but it's uh, it's called uh, words choreographed because it's got a dancey feeling to the poetry. With poetry, you're very free. You can basically you know choreograph whatever you believe you know is fun to do, and 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 that is, that was kind of fun. But um, uh, yeah, we all have a theme and. Um, and I think I can't exist without wanting to you know, not pretend because I've pretended all these years being on stage and, and being something I thought I needed to be when I was very young. You know, everybody kind of encourages you to be the next somebody else. So, um, uh, well, I don't I was, think that we pretend when we are on stage. I think. No, no, no. I, I, I take that back. I mean, in life, that it continues. The continuation of life is like we all know at least one ballerina or, or somebody who uh, continues once they step off stage and oh, they're still doing it, you know. And uh, <laughs> and and it, it it's you can smile at it, you know. But then most people continue living. Um, not who are we, you know? We 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 are we are a soul, you know. Or or we are, a, if you prefer to believe, we're a series of programs. Or some other people will be will believe in in God or through religion find an explanation of who it is they are, but we are we are not out there to impress people um uh we are not there to to try and sell i hate marketing for that reason we know we know we can't do without marketing but then everything is being sold we walk in the street there is not a street um where you go and you don't have at least one or two shops that are going to want to sell you something because that is the so our our lives have become you know and it doesn't mean we all have to go back to the to the, the good old Roman days or prehistory or something, because then men are going to be pulling women's hair to pull them around. But it's like we can never go back to 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 to, to this. But we are going further and further in the in the technology, and five G has proven that it is detrimental to one's health. You know. In meanwhile, we all the word starts with F. I won't use it with it because. We, we have those cell phones and we can't communicate anymore soon the the landlines will not be existing anymore you know so to remain in one's own authentic self is a huge channel a, a, a challenge you know yeah and it's so, yeah. i mean it, it it's it's definitely a decision and uh, and a commitment it's not it doesn't happen like that it with the way the society has been built up and the way we've been programmed, uh, it's it's a, it's a big big work. And for us dancers on stage and in this world where uh, yeah we have to perform, it's true that it takes um, uh, it takes even more to stay authentic and real and really centered into into your own being, you know, and and really. Um, dance from that place i mean this is i think if if we could bring that back much more i mean in the in in the even as a subject to study in school i mean you know it, it should be there for me personally this is my opinion but yeah no, de def definitely and authenticity doesn't mean you can't be acting out, out, or using it this authenticity in dance because you can be a very believable expression of a specific role be it a giselle that's or that's called acting that's different yeah but there is a different kind of sincerity that you can project if you know who it is you are mm -hmm. because then you become comfortable you know and the opposite would be the first time i saw makarava dance you would think it's all calculated until I got to know her and work with her, that everything was came by itself. And she would do a pique and then roll off point. And that 
movement, that, that cat-like movement was all hers. That was her authentic way of moving, you know? And so whatever she would do, uh, if it wasn't studied, it always somehow included this. I mean, it was, Rudolf Nureyev was an authentic emperor. So he was always this incredible force on stage that imposed and, and, and was very dominating. You know, so everybody had, Korishnikov was uh, uh, this amazing sponge for choreographers to work with who brought all the best out in him and he brought all the best out in them. You know, so that was his authentic self. Now, when you meet all these people outside, that may be very different. I'm not playing at all Grand Ballerina, you know, so, but, and that can be fun, you know, but you can't live that way, inevitably. You cannot be the domineering emperor, imperial uh, uh, expression you are on stage uh, in life if you cannot bring the simplicity of Juliet's death and, and Rome, Romeo's tears and bring them in your own life. You know? And so that, that, that's what I mean with authenticity. And, and of course, inevitably, you know, great philosophers have written about it. There's a lot of books, you know. So mm. I'm a big Plato fan. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> so just to, I mean, we're going to finish soon because it's like, yeah, no, it's, we have a little, a very little time. Um, I just, I mean, you, you've, you've said it a little bit, a little bit, but I mean, if there is anything that you, if you could go back in time and change something in your behavior, your mindset, um, and your choices or direction, would you do anything differently? Yeah, yeah, I would love to to have known I shouldn't talk so much, you know, when I didn't have to talk, you know. So, um, I mean, <laughs> the stupid example was I remember with I was choreographing my first little pas de deux was with Dominique Alfuni, and um, and uh, you know, I didn't think Dominique was the most one of the most gifted dancers I've ever met, and she took years to become a principal at ballerina, yes, because the politics were against it. Well, I didn't have to tell the whole world, you know, what was going on because I was in the house. Of course I did. You know, it, 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 it's difficult when you're Scorpio rising because you're always a detective. You want to know how the things are behind the scenes. And then well, maybe sometimes we need to, you know, not talk about it. You know, which I think that would be something I would Take certainly consider. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know I was breathing in those days. I didn't know. I did not know. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I think I would have loved to... Um, have had the time to learn how to play the piano, an instrument, just because it's a wonderful thing to have as a dancer, to, for the, yeah. one's musicality, and to understand the notes, and, and you know, Balanchine could conduct the orchestra, you know, mm -hmm. so... Um, well, he so was a yeah. musician before being a dancer. Well, he, he, he had huge background, that, you know, from his childhood on, and, and, you know, he comes from that, that period, which is a period we will not live again. Valerius de Monte Carlo, the Nijinsky days, all this, you know, through the Balanchine development of, you know, the influence that he had on every single choreographer on the planet, you know. Uh, so these, these days are, you know, we're, we're moving into an, an completely different period in time, inevitably, yeah. Hmm. So what I wanted to ask you is, I um, mean, you know, we're coming out of those two years that were quite difficult for the ballet world in general, for everybody in, in general, but for the ballet world in particular. Um, what would be the best advice you could give a young dancer that wants to start uh, his or her career today? I guess um, really look for a school and the schooling you are attracted to um, and make sure that there's at least one of the parents who uh, understands what it is you want to do because most parents will be a bit shocked uh, you know wanting to become a dancer um, because it's 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 lifespan and in our economical development financial world um, if you we were lucky in all in our days we'd continue being on stage and do character roles so we could go over age 50 
today people stop before they're 40, before they're 35, because sometimes they're so injured and sometimes they have started their careers so early that they're burned out before they're 30. Mm -hmm. So I think the advice I would give is be aware as much as you can of the, the positive and the negatives that come with the choice you make. Involve one of the parents so that person uh, can help you in your choices and and hopefully find a teacher uh, who who has a lot to give but not just as the teacher in ballet but as the guide that young people need because you need to be guided to to go out in the society and society is not stage stage may be that part of it that you may choose but for any profession the knowing who it is you are is going to make everything easier because you'll be able to say in a much easier way, yes or no. You don't, you don't have to feel obliged to do something when you know who it is you are. You may doubt, you think, well, let me think about it. Let's not make a decision too quickly. Is the first decision the best one? For some people it is, for others it's the third or the fourth or the fifth. So um, be very open to, to, um, to all the possibilities and please read, study, do more than just one part of the menu. You know, it's like staying with aperitif, you know, and just, you're just gonna have soup and then the rest, you know. Okay, some people will live with soup, but- um, Yeah, be curious, be, be curious on, on every level. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. And of course, you, 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 we always say, don't give up, don't give up because sometimes life brings you challenges that um, you think, you know, like especially these two last years, dancers being masked, the sport is being masked, but you can't breathe. You know, when the proof scientifically is out there, how detrimental it is, you know. So, and, and, and um, I think that, yeah, definitely um, one should be able to make one's own choice. And again, I think that's where the parent comes in to advise and, and then, you know, search, be curious, like you said, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did you want to read something to us? Yes, I especially, one of my favorite <laughs> philosophers is Plato, because he, he had a wonderful, simple phrasing about the soul, because I think um, whatever you choose to call the program we live, um, it, in ancient terms, it was called soul. And Plato said, all soul is immortal, for that which is always in movement is immortal. That which moves something else and is moved by something else, in ceasing from movement, ceases from living. So only that which moves itself, because it does not abandon itself, never stops moving. Beautiful. Thank you. You're very thank, welcome. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful uh, conversation. I mean, I know we could talk for six hours together, but <laughs> I'm very, I'm very grateful that you're my first guest for this series uh, of interviews. So thank you. I'm very honored. You're, you, uh, you have, a, you're a wonderful human being and, and wonderful teacher. And um, I, I applaud your efforts for, doing what you do. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.